understanding that, understanding each of those five local actions, uh, those planning processes, the needs for participation, and at the same time mapping out and benchmarking what was the current state of the technology and what opportunities it could provide. And then midway to the project, we matched these together uh, and tried to identify the best solutions for each of those local cases. And then the second half of the project has been implementing these and testing these tools. And now we are sharing the results. Um, the local actions have been working to build capacity for local resilience towards the um, sustainability. Throughout this project and more and more towards the end, we have used seven resilience principles uh, developed in previous research projects in Stockholm Resilience Center as our guiding principles and um, to reflect our local actions and also to provide inspiration for new actions within them. And we have done this uh, through the matrix tool that has been developed as part of augmented urbans. Uh, I will not go too deeply up into these local action cases and regional cases as you will hear about them uh, by the teams themselves. But I will say this that during the process we understood, perhaps not that surprisingly, that the there is a gap between the research and science concepts and the practical work. And what we need is to make translations to the central Baltic scope and uh, that relate to planners' reality. And we re realized that in order to do that, we need examples that are relatable. And we have done just that via the matrix tool. So to briefly say about the uh, local actions and case studies, first we have Vimsi, which quite nicely portrays the first, first um, resilience principle, which is maintaining diversity and redundancy. Vimsi has focused on uh, creating a vision for Main Street in Harpneme Borough and and creating diverse outdoor spaces for both people and urban nature, increasing the diversity. The next local action, Tallinn, the pollinator highway, is very much encapsulating the principle of maintaining connectivity as it addresses the connectivity for both people and pollinators. The case site is, and the plans are really important for those. Uh, our first regional case study in Stockholm has looked into slow variables and feedback loops. In the VR proto prototype developed there, uh, we visualize invisible flows in the urban space and you can experience some of the implications of growing urban structure, uh, increase in inhabitants and uh, their transportation to the air quality. And we hope this will uh, bring those topics in better to the discussion. In our third local action in thesis, uh, it's very much about fostering complex adaptive systems thinking, as they have done great variety of participatory activities for different uh, groups of citizens, uh, entrepreneurs, uh, tourists, and then really combined this with uh, data and information collected about the nature on the planning side via, via aerial photography. And 
it's really an inspiring case. Uh, in Jävle, the local action revolves much around learning. Uh, they have engaged uh, local residents and outdoor site managers to look more closely into their green surroundings and to learn how to take care of more diverse uh, green space that would be more livable for both and attractive for both people and pollinators. And in Helsinki, it has been very much about broadening in part participation. There have been three uh, pop-up uh, planning offices organized and we have used multiple different tools, also new VR applications to widen the participation. And finally, but definitely not least, we have the second uh, regional study case in Riga region, where Riga, uh, Okre and Kekava have joined forces to safeguard and build capacity for resilience of Taukava River. And it's very much about polycentric governance in action. Few learnings about XR. We have tried many tools. There is like 12 uh, different things that we have developed and tested during this project. Um, many of the local actions have used 360 uh, materials as that's really an easy first step uh, to encapsulate the spatial experience. You can quite easily do, do, do this. And uh, we have used more evolved VR, uh, 3D environments, which adds work, a workload, but also gives more control over what is shown. And it shows great promise to showcase plans in different settings to jump forward in time and see for example, how greenery will grow, and also to see, uh, as we have in Stockholm uh, prototype, uh, different scenarios of our decisions today. So there is a great power in that, but it is work consuming. And thirdly, we have tested AR to share information on site and point out things in the existing environment. And in addition to dedicated tools, there are also uh, existing, existing tools like Google Lens that can be used for, for example, engaging stakeholders to map out the um, biodiversity, different species on planning sites. I will not tell too much about the, each of the examples as you will hear about them in the presentation. So, uh, the added value for XR uh, to us is not, it's not only the better understanding, but experiencing the plans, not just to see, but also to feel. Uh, it's easier than reading maps. There is the opportunity to make virtual visits to cover even large or diverse case sites during planning workshops or meetings quite fast and then to discuss them. And there are also educational perspectives. Uh, there is possibility of taking different perspectives, seeing through the eyes of another, so to say, and to understand that perhaps my view is not the only one, but there are this plurality of different perspectives. And there is definitely a benefit in reaching new target audiences. Uh, it's not a silver bullet. We definitely still need face-to-face -face interactions and different communication methods as these tools cannot reach everyone. And there are trade-offs. Uh, between the complexity of the information that we want to show and designing it carefully so that it's still legible and understandable and interesting for the people that we are trying to communicate. 
And then we also have to consider the computer power. And it's currently work consuming task. So of course we need to be strategic and well planned about our actions to add value. And it's key importance that these align with other digitalization initiatives in cities and municipalities. And for this, we have created policy recommendations based on our experiences during this project. We have nine recommendations for XR and uh, five recommendations for participation. I will not go this through in detail in this uh, in this setting, uh, we can discuss them in the end in the conclusions. And also, you can find these in the Augmented Urban's final publication, uh, which is available at augmentedurbans.metropolia.fi uh, with password Augmented Urban's with a capital U. And so, but that's that's a brief overview. I think it's now time to move on to the li lightning presentations and hear about the cases from themselves. So let's first give the floor to Anna uh, from Tallinn. And during presentations, please write your comments and questions to chat as we will make tour around the central Baltic. Uh, thank you, Päivi. Hello. Um, my name is Anna Semyonova. I work at the uh, city of Tallinn as urban planner. I will now try to share my screen. Can you all see my screen? I hope you do. Uh, so I will give you an overview of what Tallinn did uh, with our local action in this augmented urban project. Our uh, local action uh, site is located in uh, Northern Tallinn city district, which is one of the most uh, fastest developing areas in Tallinn. And this uh, rapid growth uh, sets uh, high demand on uh, urban greenery, mobility and uh, public space. And uh, these are the topics that we address in our local action case. More concretely, we focus uh, on an area. Uh, uh, this is the high voltage uh, power line air cable corridor which locates between the most populated uh, residential area in Northern Tallinn district, uh, built in Soviet time, and is lined with uh, privately owned garages. Uh, these uh, air cables will be replaced to ground cables, and uh, this leaves a 50 meter wide area for public space development potential. Uh, we started uh, our project with uh, co-assessment, a uh, meeting with uh, different uh, stakeholders, mapping the existing uh, situation. And as the um, green corridor underneath the air cables is an urban meadow, this is a very attractive uh, living environment uh, for pollinators. And this is how our pollinator highway concept uh, uh, got its name. Uh, this phase was with a uh, very close collaboration with the University of uh, Tallinn. Uh, together we defined uh, the main target groups of uh, local action. Uh, as, the, as there are schools and uh, kindergartens within 300 meter radius of our local action site and about 13,000 inhabitants. Um, the target groups are the elderly people, preschool children, school children, area active users and the garage owners. And the University of Tallinn with their students uh, carried out uh, interviews and uh, site observations, which were very important base information for the next uh, planning phases. Uh, the main participatory activities that we carried through uh, were first of all, broad crowdsourcing uh, through a city-owned engagement tool Avalin app, 
and uh, through Mapchanel. For more local engagement, we visited nearby schools and uh, kindergartens and carried uh, pop-up events on site. We were in uh, Sela local public library and uh, together with Estonian uh, Museum of Natural History, we carried a marathon of uh, nature observation where we introduced the uh, local uh, urban nature there and um, gave an overview of uh, crowdsourcing results. Uh, to study more deeply our green corridor, we uh, ordered pollinator inventory study. And uh, this uh, study, um, uh, study confirmed that the area is already rich in species and nature, and that it is a citywide pollinator habitat and migration corridor connecting West Tallinn with North Tallinn and that its biodiversity can be easily increased by sowing and planting new uh, plant uh, species. So the level of biodiversity differs in this corridor. Our local action site is with um, medium level of biodiversity, um, and that is what we address in our local action site to improve its uh, condition. Uh, sustainable mobility uh, solution Mm, was uh, carried for analyzing the space requirements for different uh, mobilities, mainly cycle path and tram line, because uh, improving the connectivity of local action area with the rest of the city is uh, very crucial in that area. Mm, our landscape architecture solution combined uh, uh, pollinators inventory study, crowdsourcing results, and took into account the mobility solution in that uh, area, and also uh, pollinator highway concept. Uh, parallel to this uh, long planning, um, uh, parallel to long term planning, we already started uh, activating the new forming uh, public space. Uh, the keywords for that are uh, urban gardening initiation, uh, the blooming urban meadow till late fall. That means that we uh, cut the meadow only once a year, so it already attracted, uh, got a lot of attention. And we organized an urban art gallery, murals on uh, grass uh, walls. And uh, this was not only for uh, raising the attractiveness of the area, but uh, they were a very important part of uh, the next step, which we developed uh, our, our Avalin R app. And these murals worked as markers for um, uh, triggering the 3D uh, content and uh, replacing it uh, physically on site. Mm. So this is the main drawing of our landscape architecture solution, the main outcome of our project. Uh, this shows the different um, um, leisure activities uh, planned on site. Uh, uh, there is a room for expanding urban gardening area. It uh, placed the mobility topics uh, on the plan. And the very important part is that the electric masts are uh, the main uh, focus uh, points around which the um, most active uh, uh, active um, um, active uh, things happen, so to say. Our technological tool, as I mentioned, is called Avalin R app, and with this we made a huge first step in Tallinn urban planning in using uh, extended relative possibilities. It uh, visualizes the pollinator highway main ideas. Now, the main ideas are biodiversity, mobility, uh, leisure activities, and uh, new functions uh, for garages. And uh, compared to traditional 2D drawings, uh, citizens get a real life experience of the future urban space on site. Uh, it's a very playful way to communicate with citizens and uh, it facilitates discuss, discussions and helps to share knowledge. 
so this was only used as visualization of uh, pollinator highway uh, engagement was done in other uh, platforms. Mm. Key lessons learned uh, the advantages uh, from a planner's perspective concerning the use of uh, extended reality tool is that it um, brings a whole new layer uh, to participation process. Its uh, core value is experience, it's great feelings and emotions. Uh, Baby already mentioned it also briefly in her presentation. And it is the whole new way how to interact uh, with uh, planning documents. This is something that you can't achieve uh, with uh, long uh, word files or, or uh, different theme maps. It, uh, through emotions, it helps to define new problem angles or challenges in plans. And uh, it is a possibility to reach new target groups in city planning, for example, young, younger generation. Uh, this is, was just the first step that we made with uh, augmented reality. And we gathered a list of ideas how to develop it uh, further, what additional futures it should hold. Uh, we learned uh, definitely, as Baby also mentioned, that it doesn't re replace the traditional engagement uh, methods, but uh, it gives a new platform how to carry the public hearings or workshops uh, through. And yeah, we acknowledge that different target groups definitely require different addressing and engagement methods. So this is the most important slide, the whole talent team behind this uh, local action. A big applause to them and uh, especially a big thank you to our project uh, manager Anu Leisner for keeping up the team spirit and uh, coordinating this uh, project between all these different scales. Thank you. Thank you, Anna and team Tallinn. You have done impressive job with the local accent in Tallinn. Uh, we are a little bit pressed on time. So uh, let's let's move directly to the presentation from Tesis local accent and have the discussion in the end as part of the interactive session. Thank you. And Evia, the screen is yours. Thank you. Um, so hopefully you see the screen. Um, hi everyone, uh, my name is Evie and uh, I'm taking you today on a mission, uh, on a mission to Gauja River in, uh, in Tesis. Uh, we have been on several adventures through this project and these years together with the, with the project and the augmented urban themes and uh, learning and growing and, and, and having a, also a bit of challenging times uh, for ourselves to go uh, through all of this and understand uh, a very, um, some very new things for ourselves. So, um, yes. So this is where we are located. Um, this is, is a town in the heart of uh, Gaia National Park in Latvia, uh, with a vibrant old town and a med medieval history. But for our local action site, we actually chose um, a place quite distant from the city center, uh, about three kilometers uh, from the city center, uh, located at the Gauja River. Um, this place is quite special as it's um, as it's really really green. Um, it has a Soviet resort, uh, Tirolis in it. Uh, there are a variety of protected nature habitats, um, ski slopes and hiking paths, and uh, all in all, two great neighborhoods that are quite uh, sparsely populated. Sorry. <laughs> and um, for, the, for the local action uh, site, we we're going through numerous activities during these years with the project. Um, a great part of our journey has been participation activities um, involving such groups as 
local and uh, regional planners and architects, um, local citizens, of course. Um, we've organized events together with the kids to imagine a different kind of uh, Gauhi River surroundings. Uh, we have asked our citizens if uh, and how this place could become a resort again. We have collaborated with, uh, with brilliant architecture students uh, and who created quite, quite uh, interesting and, um, and uh, brave ideas uh, for the Gawi River. Uh, we've even organized a hackathon uh, to solve both planning and climate issues actually. Um, but the main highlight for myself uh, was the pop-up planning office that we did a little bit more than a year ago, uh, which was quite, quite memorable for, for our citizens as well, um, and, and gave a chance for everyone to come in for a chat about uh, this beautiful place that we have. Um, and uh, yes, as, as, as also Pavi mentioned in the beginning, uh, we have also have, have had quite an interesting experience together uh, with different kinds of partners, and one of them being uh, the Environmental Solutions Institute, uh, where we collaborated to get a different kind of data set that you would see uh, usually in the planning documents. So this was uh, quite interesting to have this um, aerial mapping uh, tool available for us. Um, and this created quite a different look at uh, the local action site that we had. Um, and uh, of course, during these projects, we have also tried to explore as much technology as possible while keeping it uh, as simple as possible, as understandable uh, for the citizens to use. And uh, we have actually found out that such technology solutions as 360 pictures, um, visualizations, um, also different kind of maps or simplified models, and a chatbot <laughs> can actually be super uh, successful and super interesting for, for uh, anyone to use that are also simple uh, in the way that they are produced um, and used for, for planning. Uh, of course, we have done this uh, both in person, while it was still possible, using a touch screen and headsets. Um, and uh, this uh, was proven also to be quite a memorable uh, thing for uh, participants to do, as not every day um, our local inhabitants get a chance to uh, to see their uh, surroundings with a, with a headset. Um, and uh, we've also done activities online, which uh, then brings on even more um, possibilities for people to interact uh, with, the, with these solutions. As a result, uh, we have achieved, uh, I would say, a truly integrated understanding of our local action site. Uh, but you will probably have to read about it in our publication when it will be final. Uh, something that Pivey already shared uh, with you. And uh, maybe just a few key learnings for us during this project uh, is a really deep understanding that planning for resilience can be difficult, can be, can be really interesting, but it, it really means planning uh, both for environment, for, so, for, for social uh, aspects, for the people living there, and also the economic aspects and trying to understand how to bring uh, activity in the site. Um, and participation can be really mem memorable and exciting for people if you choose to do it a little bit differently. Uh, if you choose a hiking event instead of post-it notes, for example. And all in all, the technology can really help 
uh, urban planning improve participation if it's done right, if it's simple enough, if it's involving, and if, uh, if it also serves a purpose for the viewer, for the participant. Um, that's it for us, quite fastly going uh, to the project. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to experience all of this. Thank you, Evia. A really good uh, summary of the thesis experiences and impressive work. Um, and let's move on to the first keynote from Magnus. Magnus Sön, our advisory board member, uh, who is, yes, and Magnus, the screen is yours. Thank you, Pavi. Uh, I need to put on, put on the microphone as well. Can you see uh, my screen, just to make sure? My presentation is visible, I hope. Otherwise, you have to tell me. Um, this talk is going to be, my name is Magnus Schoen. I'm a landscape architect and I'm an architect. I, I, I cannot see, see your screen. You can't see the screen. I'm sorry, I have to share the screen again, sorry. Um, share, here we go. Now. Um, see your screen. Much better. Sorry. Um, um, I work uh, as a consultant in Stockholm in a, in a co architecture office called Quad Architects. Uh, I'm also head of sustainability there. Um, and I've been a member of the advisory board in the Augmented Urbans project. And I want to give you some insights on what it's like to work uh, commercially with the principles of resili resilience um, um, to broaden this view on resilience. Um, and what we do in our office, we do urban planning, we do landscape architecture, and we do architecture and some innovation and sustainability projects uh, on the side from our commercial projects. And we try to have an integrated approach where we don't separate the different disciplines um, of uh, architecture, uh, which is a little bit of a holistic approach. Um, and we have a philosophy that we want to be really site specific and we want to propose stuff that promotes human well-being and this is usually the con context that we're active in we have uh, people of course in the center we have a municipal urban vision that we have to consider we have a client that usually pays us money and uh, we have a site uh, which we uh, see as a resource and we have to use it and analyze it wisely and be around all this, we try to stay within the planetary boundaries um, to, to propose sustainable and resilient uh, solutions. And um, resilience, um, the definition is the capacity of a system to deal with change and continue to develop. And this system can be a city or a neighborhood or a single building, for example. And a resilient system can withstand shocks and even use uh, disturbances as catalyst for renewal, renewal and innovation. And we came in contact with the concept of resilience um, uh, six, seven years ago uh, when we were working on this project together with people from the Stockholm Resilience Center, where we, um, instead of looking at the dense urban uh, parts of Stockholm, we tried to look at the suburbs and, and how those could um, contribute to more housing in, in, in the city. Um, we found that we could produce 500,000 new housing units if more people were just sharing their spaces that they already had in, in the urban environments or the suburban environments. And we also uh, looked at how these suburban areas uh, could contribute to the resilience of the city as a whole if you just improved some aspects of it or kind of informed the residents that they had a value, their gardens had a value. And through this work, we, we got to know people from the Stockholm Resilience Center, which really inspired us to use the concept of resilience uh, much, much more in, 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 in our work, in our daily work. And what we the basic insight is that man and nature are not separated entities. They're really closely connected. And we have to use that and, and think about that when we propose uh, spatial solutions for, for our future cities. Uh, I think this diagram really uh, shows it very well, like a, 
never-ending uh, loop uh, where man and nature coexist. Uh, the Stockholm Resilience Center also have made a fantastic publication um, where they combined all the results into kind of seven guiding principles, what builds resilience in social ecological systems. And Peu was showing a little bit of this before. We've, um, this is our basics for, for our work. And we produced uh, this kind of matrix um, for, uh, that we use uh, when we start a project, especially larger urban planning projects um, to kind of get an overview of what we can do in, in the specific um, project. Uh, because you can't do everything in each project, you can't uh, um, you can't fulfill all the the principles of resilience in every project that you do. But we done this matrix to to get an overview, and we combined it with the traditional um, 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 levels of sustainability as well, social, ecological, and, and economic. And you can also overlay uh, the global sustainability goals, and you see that you can also kind of through working with resilience meeting some of the uh, global sustainability goals as well. And this uh, matrix has some uh, questions or reminders, let's say. And we uh, use it internally in our office. And we, in the best case scenario, we also get a meeting with our client that we can, can, can do like a, a plan together uh, using the principles uh, of resilience in the project. And I'm going to go through the seven principles and see, kind of look at some examples that we have done and some what other people have done to kind of highlight what we spatially can, can do with the resilience principles. So we're going to start by looking at the maintain diversity and redundancy. And it's not only about biodiversity, it's also about social diversity. And I hope this image kind of shows this um, quite well. It's, it's always a mixture of, of the dimensions of sustainability. And why you need to, to focus on diversity is because it, monocultures are usually not very resilient. If you <laughs> compare this, uh, we look at this image, if you, you shouldn't put all your eggs in the same basket. If you drop it, everything will, will be destroyed. That's kind of the basic uh, uh, thinking behind maintaining diversity. And uh, we found a really good tool to, to work with biodiversity. It's called Urban Ecosystem Services. Um, there are lots of them, but they, they give us a lot of benefits. If you, if you use nature in a wise way, uh, it can add so much value and well-being um, to, for us humans. So it's a really nice thing to do is to map out existing ecosystem services in, in an, on a site or in a project, see what's missing and see what can be added. Um, uh, in the project, um, because it will give us um, uh, better well-being. Uh, and uh, you also need a good understanding uh, what kind of builds a good ecosystem. Um, this is an, an, an image from the Stockholm Resilience Center that highlights that this, this bird is actually um, maintaining the e uh, oak uh, landscape in Stockholm by moving around the acorns and hiding them. But you don't only need this bird, uh, the bird also needs a habitat and you have to be very precise about what this bird needs to preserve a whole ecosystem. And that's an insight that we that we have is that we, we have to make room for other um, biological beings uh, apart from, from, from us humans in, in our projects. And um, we've also heard already in this morning that we need to plan for pollinators and this also needs space uh, and that has to be considered early, early in the projects that we that we do so that we don't lose lose environments for for other <laughs> living um, um, companions. Um, social diversity. This image uh, is a housing project that we've done here in Stockholm. Maybe it doesn't look that diverse, but it, you should look at the programmatic um, con, um, content of, of this uh, building instead, because it, it has a huge variety of, house, of apartment sizes. It has a kindergarten, it has other spaces for other uses and commercial spaces. And this is kind of a, a way that we use a lot in our office uh, to promote social diversity, to plan for different groups of people to coexist in one space so that they form uh, close bonds, um, which kind of builds a social resilience in a way. 
Um, the best way, of course, is to combine um, biodiversity and social diversity in, in new plants. This is an image from a plant that we did in Knivsta in the north of, north of Stockholm in the central park where we proposed a lot of green together with a high degree of social diversity. The next principle is to manage connectivity, which is super important as well. And you can do that, do that in, in different kinds of way. Of course, um, green connectivity is crucial uh, for um, the future of our cities to see, make sure that green spaces are connected in good ways. Uh, this is a large scale um, map of uh, Norra Djurgårdstaden in Stockholm. We haven't done this. But you can also use uh, connectivity in a smaller scale when you do like just one block of housing, for example, this is a project that we did, it's a housing project, where you can see that we didn't put um, the buildings towards the street, like we made openings instead to, to connect nature in, onto the street as well and to, to give access for people to nature through this, this housing block. You see how we um, um, done this in, in this tiny diagram. Um, so connectivity is, is, is key, uh, both for people and for nature. And we also, um, in this project, to, we um, looked at the, the, the species, the um, native species on the site and tried to replicate those in, in the gardening design for this, for this project as well. This is a, a kind of a bigger project that we did. Of, 10 years ago, um, it's all about connectivity. We were assigned to do a park under a highway, which where nobody could, could be or could stay. Um, but of course, we couldn't leave it at that. It would be basically a, just a huge uh, shortcut uh, through, through the site. So we tried to work with the connectivity of the green spaces by the lake and put, uh, keep, give, bring it more into the city and the city spaces more towards uh, the lake as well. And we also kind of sneaked in a program which was uh, skateboarding. So we were eventually um, allowed to do um, uh, sides of these pathways um, skateboard friendly. Uh, so it's a mixture of uh, the social connectivity and the green connectivity, which you see in these images. And we were quite surprised when we did like a base, big, big shortcut that people still started using this space and stayed there. And so it also promoted kind of a social kind of closer connectivity. People got together in this space that we proposed. Uh, a really uh, valuable uh, thing to keep in mind when you work with connectivity is to prioritize or reverse the traffic pyramid. So you prioritize walking people, basically. That's one of the things that we work a lot with in our proposals. Um, to manage slow variables and feedbacks. Um, sounds a bit tricky, but for us, it's about looking at the um, flows and the material flows and the invisible flows that kind of comes in like a metabolic system to our, to our cities and environments and also goes out uh, and leaves waste products. Um, so a tool for us is to think of our project in a life cycle um, assessment kind of way. So you have to make sure that everything that you propose, all the buildings materials that you propose, that they are kind of a source in a good way and kind of can be uh, used in a loop. Um, the principles of reduce, reuse, recycle is something that we kind of apply uh, in this uh, principle of resilience. This is a park we did in Northern Sweden in Umeå where all the stones were um, recycled. Uh, it was, it's really close to the, to the river in Umeå and the stone is old keystone that was uh, demolished like 50 years ago and just kept in a storage in, in the woods. And when we found that we, we were so happy and that we could, uh, could use this space, these stones again and, and produce a whole new park with a much, much smaller um, carbon dioxide imprint uh, than it would have been if we did all this in other materials, new source materials. This project was also a little bit about participation and increasing biodiversity with the planting, but that's the main thing is about um, the, um, the slow variables, the materials. Um, an insight that we have is that we have to stop using concrete. It's the most destructive material on earth. Um, 
uh, in the process of making cement, the huge amounts of, of carbon dioxide is released, uh, which is a, a really weird um, contribution to the, to the climate issue that we have. And luckily, um, we have alternatives. So most of our products uh, that we do, we proposed we proposed wood uh, instead. Um, so we've done a lot of um, wood projects recently. This is an extension of a single family home, um, semi-detached houses in the north of Stockholm, um, more semi-detached houses. You can use paint, you can use natural wood. It, it's a fantastic material. And it can also be part of another carbon cycle than the carb than concrete, uh, which can be reused, reduced and recycled and also put back into the soil again. And we're also looking at uh, proposing um, higher buildings in wood, which uh, is possible now with the use of um, CLT, cross laminated timber, which is a fantastic opportunity and we've done uh, two um, projects in that material, three projects in that material already, and the interiors you can you you can see the wood and it gives a fantastic feeling um, also uh, inside. Um, next principle: foster complex uh, adaptive systems thinking. Um, it's about accepting that change will always occur. You have to work with that and you have to accept that. You can just look at yourself like you grow older day by day and your needs are going to change uh, when when your life uh, progresses let's say so that's something you have to keep in mind when you when you work uh, spatially uh, even the old greeks knew that thousands of years ago nothing stays still um, this is an example from malmö where they um, kind of work with with change in a in a fascinating way they are starting to um, propose new species of trees and vegetation in the denser urban Malmö urban uh, areas because they know that the climate is changing um, so the species that they have today will probably not manage so they have to introduce um, gradually new species in the urban environment and in Stockholm, uh, you work with change, we get more rain, more intense rain. So this is a, a way of managing the stormwater in a, in a new way in, in, the, in the urban environment, uh, which we're very much inspired by and try to, to propose as much as we can in our projects as well, so that you reduce piping and let uh, nature do the work of taking care of these heavy storm uh, water flows instead. Um, also, um, more concretely, this is a project that we've done uh, is to, to look at adaptive reuse of the existing structures that we have, because we all know that uh, the most sustainable uh, space is the one that we never have to build that we all so that we use what we have already. So we're hoping that we can do more of these kind of projects that we kind of change uh, buildings instead to retrofit them and make adaptive reuse of the existing built environments. This is an underused attic that we uh, transformed into a more uh, usable office space in the central parts of Stockholm. Looking like this, kind of blending in a little bit in the urban environment. Um, and how do you spatially encourage learning uh, in a commercial setting? Of course, the most obvious way is to map out the needs of um, traditional learning institutions like schools, uh, preschools, um, yeah, stuff that we already know and make space for that. But there are also um, interesting new ways of, of creating knowledge, um, which we've been doing uh, recently in this project, um, working on right now. It's a combined preschool and nursing home, um, which um, there's also even a TV series on Swed Swedish television now that shows these experiments where, where kindergarten children um, or, or uh, visiting uh, a nursing home uh, on a daily basis. And they uh, kind of see that uh, the older people kind of really benefits from that and the younger people really learns from the older ones. Uh, so it's a kind of intergenerational learning environment. Um, so this goes on, this uh, combination is inside the building and it's also on the courtyards where so both these uh, programmatic uh, groups have access to the same spaces and they're supposed to meet and exchange knowledge here. 
Another example of a more creative way of uh, encourage learning is to propose, um, this is a, an invention that we did, it's called urban ecotech. So we kind of Im imagined uh, almost like a library, almost like an outdoor library, uh, which is a connection of, um, of urban spaces, green spaces with uh, learning spots. Um, this is an urban project that we did in the south of Stockholm in Farsta. Um, so you, you really need to be um, creative with the learning aspects and, and, and take that into consideration when you plan the cities of the future. I'm not going to go into broad participation that much because uh, the augmented urbans uh, is all or a lot about that. Um, we've done that in, in many projects and my um, key insight in that uh, field of resilience is that if you do good um, participation, if it works, you really get nice ambassadors for your project. So it will be taken care of, it will be um, nicely talked about, and people will be much more happy with the project if, if you involve um, people in a good way in the project. Um, one other thing about participation is that is this, which we haven't done this much, this is, is an example from Malmö by Kord Siegel. It's a um, housing consortium, or in German, Baugemeinschaft, or it's, it's a way of co-creating your own living space. Uh, it gives residents a, a, a chance to, to kind of produce the way they want to live themselves. So planners have to allocate space for these initiatives to, to happen in, in the urban environment, much, much more uh, in, my, in my view. Um, it's a really nice example of how you can, can broaden participation in a, in a little bit smaller uh, way. And the last principle is to promote polycentric governance. It's, it's a tricky one for us working in commercially. But I have a good example from Stockholm. It's a park quite close to where I live. I'm not involved in this at all, but it's an in initiative from, from, from local citizens to, to take care of an existing park and to do agroforestry and urban gardening there. And it's open to everyone. Uh, everyone can participate. Um, and um, it kind of gives um, a win-win situation because the city needs less park space to take care of this is done by the residents and the residents can can express and do uh, what they feel like is important for for the site and it's open for everyone and if one stakeholder kind of fails a little bit the other one can step in and take over so it's kind of it, it's a win-win situation and i think this needs to be um introduced much much more in in our cities uh, for the future to promote polycentric governance. Right. Um, I want to finish off uh, by showing uh, a, a, some slides from a, a larger planning project that we've been working on for five years now, off and on. It's in uh, Gustavsberg, which is about 30 minutes east of Stockholm. It's a small town famous for its porcelain factories, um, which unfortunately, unfortunately are closing down much more now. Um, a really nice uh, setting in the Stockholm kind of archipelago and a nice landscape there. Um, you see in this image where the town center is and you see the former porcelain factories, the Baltic Sea, very centrally located sports facilities and the town hall. And we were asked in a kind of competition to, to propose a way of developing um, this town, basically, where we used uh, the principles of resilience, resilience in, a, in a kind of urban planning way. Uh, what we wanted to do was to, to keep the kind of strong identity of the landscape in this setting um, and respect the, the, the archipelago landscape and cultural heritage. And we saw that the communities here were a bit disconnected. So we proposed new connections. And of course, we prioritized walking and cycling accessible public transport was very important and more public space um, and of course uh, as all cities now are growing we need to propose um, inclusive and safe housing and develop the sports facilities as well which is kind of unique to have this opportunity centrally located in, in a town integrated urban nature and ecosystem services and we proposed an incremental development strategy so that you don't do 
everything at once because um, yeah, you should take it a little bit slow and learn from, from your mistakes in the process of develop, developing this uh, town. Um, the kind of backbone of all this is uh, a new park with integrated stormwater management, which connects kind of the, the, the town center and the porcelain factory, which is under redevelopment. And it gives a new public space, which, is, which uh, kind of uh, promotes uh, resilience in, in a new way, in many different ways. And we also developed the sports facilities with uh, more activities, mainly targeted towards um, women and, and young girls, uh, because it can be like many sports facilities can be kind of dominated um, by men so that we could diversify this sports area a little bit more. Um, regarding housing in this uh, scheme, um, we were given a site where we should focus more on. Uh, we're still working on this. It's not built yet, but we're in the planning phase, kind of final stages of the planning phase for this. Um, it's a fairly sensitive biotope. It has a green connectivity over it. It's very close to the sports facilities and uh, the town hall, and it has a kind of complicated topography as well that has to be taken into consideration. Um, our proposal is to build densely to save a lot of the existing nature and of course adapt it to the topography so that we don't have to um, take away um, bits of the landscape. We propose wooden buildings of course and there were some listed buildings on the site that we also needed to include um, in, in, in the scheme that we propose. And we integrated stormwater management trying to pr promote programmatic diversity give public access to nature and also connect to the surrounding uh, neighborhoods and the town uh, center and the town hall. Just to conclude, this is a few uh, images showing what this could look like. Um, you see how the buildings kind of sneak into the nature, but still keeping a lot of the nature. You see the angle of the building uh, buildings is uh, to uh, choose later on if you want to add solar solar panels on top of each building it's possible you otherwise you you preferably do green roofs here and we also try to hide all the cars uh, underneath the new constructed landscape um, so that they would wouldn't dominate um, the the site just by parking the cars um, closing in on what the living environment could be like it's um, yeah, here is an image from the sports facilities, how the new buildings um, kind of look out to the town. And we wanted everyone to feel that they were actually living in nature. So each apartment has a door that opens to the to the free space or out, even though it's a few stories up in the air. Um, your door is never, um, it, it feels like almost living in a, in a house, basically. Right, so I hope uh, that this gave, us, gave you some insights on what it is like to work uh, commercially with the resilience and um, yeah, hope it's been inspiring. Thank you. Thank you, Bangdus. That was super inspiring and really good set of examples, practical examples that we need about uh, applying these principles into the practice. I'm sure that there would be um, <laughs> many, many questions and uh, comments to discuss, but let's let's save those for the interactive session. Uh, thank you also for being part of the Augmented Urbans project. As an advisory board member, it has been super valuable, but let's, let's move on to the next lightning talks. And next we have uh, local action in Jävle and Marita. Yes, hello. I will tell you more about the local action in, in Gävle. I'll try to share my screen here and start my presentation. Uh, let's see, can you, can you see my presentation now? I hope so. If not, just tell me. Uh, this local action in Gävle has been a collaboration between University of Gävle and Gävle Gårdarna. And my name is Marita Wallhagen. I'm an associate professor at the university. And it's a pleasure for me to present this project. It has been a lot of people involved in it. And I, I, I tried to summarize it the best I can. 
The local action sites in our project has been Gavle Gorana's residential neighborhoods. And the main goal in the project was to create more attractive, sustainable and resilient outdoor environments for people and pollinating in insects. And the starting point was here that today we have lots of asphalt surfaces which are unattractive, unsustainable, not resilient and not very socially sustainable either. And the greenery in those neighborhoods and in cities in general is mainly lawns with just grass and that's not very sustainable or resilient either. Instead, we, we aim for something more or like an augmented urbanity, which is attractive, sustainable, resilient, and socially sustainable. So that was our goal. And we performed several activities to reach this. We worked, for example, with some social aspects by creating, we had creative multidisciplinary design processes with the multidisciplinary workshops with different stakeholders and experts, workshops with tenants and managers. We did questionnaires and had also lots of students involved in designing things and doing projects. When it came to the site, the physical areas and the environments for people and pollinators, we worked with transforming lawns into meadows in various ways. We created bee hotels and bee beds in sand. We also delivered mini flower gardens to tenants to care for and had inventory of pollinators on site. All those things to, to improve the, the environment for pollinators and the people living in those neighborhoods. And throughout the project, we use XR technologies and try to integrate them in this process. We, for example, we, we filmed sites with 360 cameras. We had experiments with testing VR glasses and we developed a prototype of an AR application. I will tell you a little bit more about that. So we first, when it came to the technology, we, we filmed the sites with these 360 cameras and made videos where you had both the sound and picture. And then we tested the air glasses in various ways, for example, to, to look at the sites from a distance and see if it could be possible to use it in design purposes and in design processes. And it was very promising that the, this technology can be used in that way, even though 360 videos are very heavy files, and that's a small problem. Uh, we also de developed an AR app prototype of uh, where you can see information about your environment and plants planted in the outdoor environment um, in your mobile phone. And that all the information is GIS position and you can have it directly. It would be a tool that could be possible for managers to, to help to use to help them treat and take care of the environment in a better way. And also for tenants to learn more about the environment and get more engaged and learn more about biodiversity and ecosystem services. We learned a lot in this uh, project about the key lessons learned and maybe future perspectives that we want to spread to others when it comes to creating more attractive environments for people and pollinating insects. Is uh, of course some things we did. We we did meadows and this AR application as a way to um, to increase the resilience on site. So we hope that makes made those sites a little bit more closer to this augmented urbanity, a little bit more attractive and sustainable. And uh, those things were, were done also because we learned that we need to increase the knowledge about biodiversity and ecosystem services. So among tenants, but also managers and property owners and everyone. And you can then work with increasing awareness, work with information on site, like our application plans to do, and also involve people more in the management and design processes in decisions. And um, as our properties or the sites we work with was um, mainly managed by others, uh, the, in, the procurement process is, is very uh, important. So improving the procurement is also imp important to really get high quality management of all the green areas outdoor to really increase biodiversity. Then you have to invite specialists in the in the process to learn more about biodiversity also include explanations why you need to do certain things and also follow up the results and uh, another thing that also we think we learned is that actually policy also influences these processes and therefore we need to influence policy to integrate biodiversity and ecosystem services more in policy and policy documents and we were very happy when the city architect managed to get in greenery as one of the aspects in 
our new architectural policy in Gävle. But there are other ways also to work with this, like educating politicians and officials more, promote more dialogue, and also include those aspects in the process in general. So to summarize uh, with all the things we learned, we, we think that the project outcomes, for example, have been mainly that we have been using and learning more about tools and getting knowledge for creating more attractive sustainable environments for people and pollinators. In our project, we it was mainly with the meadows and mini gardens and inventory of site, but also the technology is very promising in this area. And then also the processes for particip participation, learning, knowledge generation, knowledge exchange, co-creation and collaboration is something we take with us from this project. And we want that, we hope that others can learn from it and that it can be used more. So this was a short presentation of our local action. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Marita. Wonderful summary of Jävle activities and interventions. A wonderful work you have done. And then uh, next up we have Vimsi and Sim. Hello, can you see my screen? Uh, not yet. Okay. But we can hear you. Yes. Uh, can you see now? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, hello, my name is Siim Siim, and I am a local action coordinator for Wiimsi Municipality, and I'm going to have short presentation about our local action. So, case and context: uh, Wiimsi is a small municipality in Estonia, uh, situated next to Tallinn, and it's and it is one of the highest uh, median income uh, municipalities. Uh, municipality in Estonia and uh, all, we had two things on which uh, we focused. Uh, first of all, Havn and Polnustas have a master plan uh, and Havn uh, needs to have a master plan in order to regulate development and to set long-term goals in spatial planning. Uh, because there is no master plan, there is also no grand vision of how should Havn be in the future, both in spatial planning context and the social context. And we had also, the, uh, another aspect was that uh, Havnem and Poroth does not have a uh, main street. Uh, Havnem needs to have uh, its own center so that its residents could spend more time in Havnem rather than in uh, capital Tallinn. The uh, problem here is that there is a uh, little in Havnem to bring people to spend their free time Basically, there is no human friendly space where people would like to be. So our main uh, activity is done uh, in BMC. Uh, uh, around the uh, street, uh, in order to break this uh, half the main street, we had uh, project consultation with different, different experts, urban planners, environmental experts, landscape architects, traffic specials and etc. Uh, also we had uh, on the street project discussion with the Wien schools and kindergarten board of governors. In order to ask the opinions from local community leaders. We also had uh, run the street project uh, call up in internet uh, in order to engage the whole Wimsi population, because at that time already the coronavirus problem had reached Estonia. Uh, we had over 240 participants in this internet uh, poll. Also, we published um, a number of articles in the local newspaper. And we also had in summer, summer 2020, a special newspaper in where we presented our Main Street vision. Basically, it was four pages 
of newspaper in which we also had uh, detailed projects of uh, what's uh, going to be in our main street. Also, we coordinated and, uh, and created development of uh, our freedom model, 360 videos of our main street and uh, master plan uh, participatory platform in order to uh, show people what's, uh, what's to come with our half member master plan. And uh, quite recently also had the uh, Augmented Learners project, project exhibition in the White Weems Library Exhibition Hall. We had, in two weeks, we had some 4,400 uh, visitors in there. So we were rather surprised by the results. So XR tools. Uh, during the Augmented Urban's project, uh, Weems municipality decided to deploy three different uh, digital tools that each address a particular scale of planning and fits the distinct communication needs of the phase. Uh, considering the wide definition of XR tools combined uh, digital and XR capabilities in various degrees, uh, with no previous experience in using XR tools in the municipality for the first tool in VMC, we decided to start with a, what, what was simple online 3D digital visualization of the comprehensive plan projected to developments and their scope. Uh, initial procurement raised uh, issues for the municipality as the final outcome had all the functions they asked for, but was not as user-friendly as envisioned. In order to develop a better user interface, the municipality collaborated with Metropolia University of Applied Science students who provided constructive feedback and developed ideas to the 3D model user interface. Based on using the user journey method for interaction design, this tool enables the user to digitally explore the free the model for ongoing general plan outcomes. They can also give feedback either to specific points or to more general areas. Each user can only see their own comment while the overview of all comments is visible to the planner in form of summer table in municipality. The Harbour and Freedom model was useful tool for municipality officials and teams and residents interested in, in the planning process. Uh, when it came to our main street uh, solution, we had a series of 360 degree views of Randwell Road solution was assembled to be viewed either online or using VR glasses. This XR visualization was developed in order to give users better understanding of the new Main Street through a pedestrian aisle level view. As part of the participation process, a special effort was put into showing the new Main Street solution to surrounding schools, both the students and their parents to gather user experience and input to, to the project. The Randwera Road project uses solutions that offer more biodiversity and sustainable mobility options. Hence, there is a need for extra communication about the multifunctionality of the, these uh, new solutions. Uh, for example, it needs to be communi communicated how the specific plants chosen support multi-level biodiversity, such as plants or pollinators and so on. And also offers other services such as traffic noise minimization and lowering overall maintenance costs. Similarly, it can be demonstrated how different street design elements help uh, make uh, the area more easily accessible to all models of, the modes of transportation. Uh, also, we created an interactive web-based map application to communi communicate uh, with locals. The application gives a clear visual overview of strategic aims, guiding principles of spatial development, land use, developing areas, mobility, environmental issues and opportunities, and uh, public space developments using visual storytelling, interactive maps, and user-friendly data visualization. It also gives a general outline of the master plan. 
very interesting. Uh, this online application was found to be engaging and easily accessible on all screen. Uh, in future, a couple of weeks, we are going to have a participatory process for our Harbneme master plan. So hopefully, we will see how useful this kind of tool is that we created. And the key lessons that we learned during this uh, process all. Uh, for us, it was importance of cooperation with public when designing public spaces. Uh, it creates a certain level of trust between parties and local residents appreciate when they are involved. Also, when you cooperate with public, that, uh, them, they will already be, be familiar with it uh, once uh, you present uh, the solution to the wider public. Uh, local officials often times actually know what uh, local residents want and need regarding to public space development. Meaning that uh, I think officials can trust their instincts when it comes to public, public uh, space planning. And uh, involving people with IT skills on your team when you procure XR solutions. Uh, we had uh, many problems with communi communicating with our 3D model creators, for example. For us, the problem was that basically we don't speak so-called IT language. And however, that's for in our case, that was the only way they could communicate. So that's uh, for us, it was a rather painful lesson. And also as a municipality, we discovered that we have a great venue where we can have thousands of uh, visitors in week. Uh, so there is a place where, can we, where we can set up uh, what we want uh, to present to the public and uh, we could have so so-called passive participation. Anyone who passes by can, can see what's going on in the municipality. And uh, finally, I would like to thank our, our VMC team, uh, Anu Leisner, our project manager, and uh, Margot Söth, we, who helped with our participation activities. And that's all from me. Thank you, Steve and team VMC. Uh, and now uh, we are moving to our second keynote from Lauri Lemmenlehti from Forum Virium. Lauri. Great to have you with us, and the screen is yours. Thank you very much, baby. Uh, hey, everybody, I'll kind of like catch my presentation from here, share screen. This is always a little bit exciting moment. Will it work or not? But uh, can you see my orange background? Self. Okay, just a second. We'll try it again. Mm. Can you see now my presentation? Uh, in a minute, I think we will. Yeah. It's still. Just double click to enter full screen mode. Okay. Has started screen sharing. One day this will work. Because, um, okay, I'll do it again. Yes. I see a black screen. Um, I don't know what's happening here right now. Um, 
do you have the presentation do you have the presentation on drive or can you send it to yalmari and you can show it from here yes hey, uh, let's try it actually in a way that um i'll maybe can you kind of like move on to the to the next city things and and uh, i'll save this to pdf and i'll try to try it from there okay let's do so and uh, sorry for this. One, do we have elena and riga hi yes uh, let me just get ready to present them and riga riga is our one of our regional study cases so great to hear from you okay let's see i'm gonna share my screen Can you see my presentation? No? Yes. yes. Should I do slideshow? Now you don't see my notes, right? <laughs> we just see your presentation. Okay. So hello everyone. My name is Alina and today I'm representing Riga Planning Region team. So during the Augmented Urbans project, we were working on a study called Resilience by the River. And so our focus was to bring attention to the wider spectrum of resilience and agility in urban planning by creating visible impact on site. And we did that by working together with local communities. And as we were doing these small scale interventions, we tested the new augmented mixed use technologies and encouraged their use in participatory planning. But in order to, in order to be more spatially specific, we set the focus on our region and we studied how resilience has been addressed in spatial plans in Riga region. So we had three uh, case areas Krovinsela, Tjakava, and Ogra, and we kind of link these three cases with something we've done in previous projects called the Knowledge Mile, or, or rather like a cluster of um, university campuses uh, in the city center near River. And our study focuses on these three cases and is referencing resilience towards this common value in our region, the River Daugava. And what we did, we really focused on a bottom-up approach uh, to establish relationship with locals, gather and combine local knowledge, and link it with some professional competencies on our project team, sort of combining uh, these two important aspects. And I would say our study was a true expedition more than it was a typical uh, desktop research. For example, at Krumingsela Island, we tested a new waterway that would then serve as a linking point, as a connection from linking the knowledge and innovation in urban center and university campuses, linking this with territories kind of on the outskirts of the city that usually don't get so much spotlight or um, attention. Uh, so, and we also carried out a co-creation session here and based on local stakeholder ideas, uh, students from Riga Technical University created some uh, visuals and interesting models for, for example, here in this case, um, a model for, uh, for a docking point for small water vehicles or boats. And then in Tjakava, we explored options to how to regain access to the river, but do it respectfully, respecting the existing biodiversity. And thus here, an idea with the local stakeholders uh, was born uh, for a floating bridge, uh, to kind of uh, let people enjoy this riverine landscape from afar without intruding. And the last case, Uagre, Uagre brought us a huge knowledge transfer and presented itself as a good example of how to manage a complex river city relationship. Uagre has set in place a monitoring system for flood management and through building resilience, through building this uh, dam for protection, 
is also creating additional values uh, such as unique public spaces for people to enjoy. And now a couple of slides for Egils to speak on about technology. Egils, are you with us? Yep, yeah, I'm here. Hi, hi guys. So technology tested and showcased it ranges from sophisticated professional tools to accessible, easy to use tools that do not require deep tech knowledge and large investments. We used photogrammetry by drone development to map our case areas and gather input data for a common GIS platform and for some 3D models. For example, mapping Wagri River uh, Valley that uh, when combined with LiDAR data is used for flood modeling and management. We <clears throat> then again, we use simple tools like Google Lens to map existing biodiversity on sites and engage stakeholders simply by using their phones. Another tool we used was RoundMe, an online tool for creating 360 degree excursions online, basically VR tours to make materials created by augmented urbans local touch available for everyone. Yes, and so finally with this project and with this new technology and these new findings and learnings, we set the base for creating a comprehensive Riverine open source GIS platform, not so much focusing on municipalities or regions, but rather putting the river Daugava as the focal point. Because no matter how the boundaries of municipalities change, and that's happening in Riga right now, the river is still going to be floating, flowing. And additionally to our visible impacts on site, and technology testing, the study also resulted in a wide range of recommendations for each site and for Riga planning region. I don't, I won't go in detail here uh, right now, but you can ask me about this later. But the most important one for Riga planning region regarding resiliency is Riga planning region currently is working on a new action plan for themselves. And so our advice would be to define resiliency measures for new planning initiatives. And as, as they are developing this new plan to organize a spe special um, workshop for resiliency and develop a re resilience framework serving as an umbrella to secure a holistic approach in the long term. And we have a lot of um, recommendations here, but to learn more about them, feel free to contact us later or talk to anyone from our team, me, Datsa, Egons, or Egils. And thank you very much. Thank you so much, Elena. That was wonderful once again hear about your activities. And then we go, we move, move to questions later. Uh, Laure, oh, will we try again? How is it looking? Or should we do another of the lightning presentations before? Um, maybe we will go to Helsinki. Laura is still trying to uh, get the, everything well. So, yeah. Welcome. Okay, thank you. Just a moment. I thought Stockholm was first, but um, let's see. So can you see my screen? <laughs> Yes. Well, so hello, everyone. I'm the Atala from uh, City of Helsinki Urban Design Department. And the uh, Telsuskatu Axis in northeastern, uh, in the north uh, part of downtown Helsinki, is being developed as a workplace and culture district with a new fast tram line. And um, to guide the zoning and the further planning of the area, we have been preparing an outline plan here and uh, in the process we have uh, done a various various different participatory actions the most important one for us and a new concept 
we tried out were, were the pop-ups that we had three of them and the idea we was to move the first slide we don't see the presentation we see the powerpoint oh no <laughs> so sorry i'll try to uh share my screen in another way So, what about now? Can you see the presentation? I see that you have started sharing the screen, but we don't see the actual screen. Ah. <laughs> it's black, the same problem as the other person has. Okay. Um, I don't know what else to do here. So, you really don't see my screen now. Uh, we saw it from the PowerPoint window, but it wasn't on the presentation mode. So, okay. So, 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 um, so I'll have... try the PDF. What about now? Uh, but we have the presentation, don't we? So we can. Uh, but you, you're not seeing my screen now. It's just black, your screen. What we see, we see that you oh. share, but it's just slash. If you share the last, last try, if you, um, this is the last try, let's then try to, what about now? Oh, same, just same thing. Well, no, <laughs> uh, but we can show it from here. Okay, well, I changed the last slide, but anyway. <laughs> presentation ready, so let's, okay. let's go to the plan B. <laughs> Okay, sorry about these technical difficulties. Okay, well, you heard the first part. <laughs> we, so, uh, but you, did you see the slide? Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, this, uh, this uh, area has been developing, developed as, as a workplace and cultural district with a new fast tram lane. And then we're now preparing an outline plan. So you can go to the next slide. So uh, the pop-ups have been a very interesting new um, concept for us. You can change the slide. And uh, so what we did is to take our workstations on site so that stakeholders could come visit and talk about the area and, and discuss our plans for the area uh, when best suitable for them. And also try out these different XR tools that we have been testing in this Augmented Urbans project. Now, uh, I can't see the slides changing. I don't know why. Now, yes. And um, apart from the pop-ups, which uh, you can see here in the image, we also had uh, breakfast seminars for um, landowners and, and uh, uh, property owners on, on the area, and then other more usual participation methods uh, in physical venues and online. So you can go to the next slide, please. Uh, different technological tools we used here. Um, in the beginning, we tried out using VR in this uh, kind of Mapgenera questionnaire about routes and good and bad places. But then we developed the VR tools further in this Bruno XR um, tool that you can see here. We took a part of our design area and modeled it further and showed possible different futures. And uh, also we put a lot of effort in showing how plants, greenery, weather conditions, lighting conditions um, affect the, the, the space and the users could um, change these conditions uh, by themselves. And then we also, also showed the greenery in different stages of growth and what kind of ecosystem services they provide. Apart from this, we tried, uh, we used 360 videos put inside the city 3D model and also touch screen showing background information and uh, participatory feedback as layers on top of the 3D model. So you can go to the next slide. I'll try to keep this short. Um, key learnings pop-up really is, is a very good tool for having in-depth discussions and for the guided use of XR, but is of course is resource heavy and only suitable for bigger projects as this one. Uh, VR is a powerful tool, but quality matters a lot. So if it's too low, then it's, it's uh, not very useful. Uh, commenting is a 
question here, how can you give feedback when having it with the glasses on? The touch screen is quite a versatile tool. It works well in pop-ups and in, in city info centers. I think it could be a very, very good tool and it's often used also. And, and one good thing about this is that it even being an XR tool, but it enables a lot of interaction and conversation around the touch screen table versus the glasses and, and a solitary experience. 360 video is also very useful in, in many ways and audio and, and voiceovers uh, give many ways of then giving more feedback and maybe even breaking the bubbles, showing different opinions on, on certain si places on the site. Next and last slide, please. Um, I would have talked about resilience too, but there's <laughs> so much things. So I wanted to um, in the end say just that history, showing history together with the present and the possible futures is something that we tried a little bit, but I would like to look into more in the future because I think it's really important in helping understand change and envision what could be. The digital twin, uh, uh, it's the reason that um, VR, for example, is not used so much yet in, in urban design is that we don't have the, concept, uh, the context modeled yet and we're going there, but I hope that we will have also the digital twin plus, so-called, that we in, in the model, then we will automatically also have the known futures that we already know what will be, even though it's not there yet. Um, you always have to uh, take in, in, you know, remember to tell the stakeholders also, what did we get from the uh, participation, give them feedback, how was this taken into account, and listen to their, um, their point of view also about the ex participatory experience. But most of all, the most important is always um, many times step back, ask, why are we doing this? What, when, when planning participation, when planning the use of different tools, XR tools, what is it we want to accomplish with this? What do we want to know? Who do we want to engage? And what is the best method in each case to accomplish this? Thank you. Thank you so much, Thea. And sorry about the technical difficulties. Um, maybe we can do so that, uh, let's take the final case example from Augmented Urbans first, and then uh, close with Lauris, Lauris uh, keynote. So let's go to Stockholm and Maria. Hi, everyone. Um, let me see. Post disabled participant screen sharing is the message I get when I try to share my screen. Um, I don't know, Yalmare or who is doing the, the sharing of permissions. Yes, right. There we are. And slideshow. Come on. Right. Um, can you see the screen now? Yes. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so my name is uh, Maria. I don't know how many are here who I haven't met, um, but yeah, my name is Maria and I have been leading the Stockholm case and I have worked together with my dear colleague Vivi. Um, we have uh, focused on Stockholm and the local site Kulan, which is a playground and preschool. Uh, we started off with a citywide scope, exploring the planning realities in a Nordic capital, and we then zoomed in to uh, the local level. So to give a brief context, uh, Stockholm is built on 14 islands. The city of Stockholm comprises 13 boroughs. Uh, the population is expected to grow rapidly to almost 1.3 million by 2040. Um, we decided after speaking with different planners to focus on the borough of Skärholmen, which is located in the southwest of the city centre. 
Uh, it is one of the areas in the city that are projected to experience the most extensive growth and development over the coming 20 years. Infrastructural development in the borough has been limited since Skärholmen was originally built in the 60s. And the residents that live there today are predominantly first and second generation Swedes. Uh, unemployment rates are higher than average. But at the same time, the borough has also a lot of green spaces and it sits beautifully on the coast of Lake Mälaren. This is to give you an idea of where we have been working. So we started off discussing with planners in different municipalities and boroughs in the greater city of Stockholm, which is the orange area you can see on the left hand side picture. Now the white circle shows roughly the extent of Skärholmen. If we move to the city, uh, the picture in the center, I have uh, made an approximate, approximate demarcation of where the area of Skärholmen, which also includes Sätra, is located. And down to the right, we see the, the um, site where Kulan is located. So what we have done, um, like I say, we started off speaking with various planners. We started at the county level, speaking with the county administrative board, where we identified the need for new digital tools for planners. We then continued at the municipal level with dialogues with planners and geostrategists in four different municipalities and borough in Stockholm to get a feel for where our activities uh, would best be suited. Uh, we eventually decided in dialogue with planners the site of Kuvulan, uh, which we used as a model site for our virtual reality prototype that we developed. Um, we chose the site because it is located in the very dynamic area of Harholmen uh, and because of the presence of preschool children at the site and the quite diverse population of Skärholmen. So we found that, uh, sorry, someone is not muted. Um, I will continue. So we chose Kulan in Skärholmen because of the dynamic context and, uh, and its strategic location. Uh, we have done, uh, during the development of the prototype, we did three live and online demos of the prototype during its development. Um, so we developed a VR prototype called Urban Sphere. Uh, we focused on presenting projected local effects of climate change and the prototype shows how the design of the landscape at site level can increase or decrease the site's capacity to adapt to the projected changes. Um, we did this partly to uh, meet the Women's Urban objective of creating tools today that can visualize changes in the future. Uh, urban sphere shows the impact of temperature increase, of flooding and droughts, uh, of decreasing air quality and decreasing biodiversity. And in biodiversity, we particularly focus on pollinators. The viewer can teleport to different locations on the site and try out different design alternatives and see how they can prevent or support the site's capacity to deal with climate change impacts. Um, the name Urban Sphere reflects the site's name, Kulan, which can be translated to the sphere. Urban Sphere will hopefully be presented to the public when possible, when the pandemic so permits. Um, and it can be viewed both in virtual reality and it can be streamed online. We are now looking at the final solution for the online streaming. These are just some snippets. Uh, the picture in the top left is uh, a photo of Kulan. And then to the right, you see the model where the different stations in our 3D model that you can visit when you uh, look at it online or in VR. Down to the left is an example of uh, grass and meadow being presented. <clears throat> and in the right, you see uh, air quality, you see flooding. Um, uh, and that is an example of how the uh, how Kulan might look in the future if uh, we don't think carefully of how the landscape is, is actually designed. So my last slide here, some key lessons learned. Although Stockholm is uh, 
a front runner. It has pioneered projects with social ecological integrated design approaches. Uh, that approach still remains to become a mainstream approach in planning. We also discovered that the realities for planners in even within this one city can be highly diverse, both in terms of society, ecology, resources, needs, limitations. Um, planners have an extremely high workload generally, uh, which together with, with structural changes within organizations and staff turnovers can, can become challenges to long-term collaborations. Um, facilitating dialogues and bridging between experts in sustainability and resilience, uh, as well as in technology, can enable the development of digital tools for planning, um, as we have seen throughout this, this project, even at the early onset of the project, uh, the three groups, uh, planners, technology developers and sustainability experts, often exist in quite diverse, um, quite separate bubbles, even though there is a clear need for them to find ways of communicating and working together. So insights about the development of the city of Stockholm, one is that uh, then focus is, is often on quantity, the sheer number of housing that's being built or should be built. Um, I call that quantity. And then we found that more tools are needed in order to understand the social ecological quality of sites. And such understanding and creative thinking can be facilitated by the inclusion of both planners and non-planners, that is inclusion of diverse knowledge sources in design and in planning. Uh, we, we see a clear scope to continue to build on the activities in oriented urbans, to continue to develop dialogues between planners and non-planners, to keep using and developing XR as tools for sustainable urban development, and to keep to more strongly integrate resilience thinking into strategies for planning, particularly for the impact, for the local impacts of climate change. That was it from Stockholm and thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Maria. Wonderful to hear about Stockholm as well. And, and now we have covered all seven cases of augmented urbans and now Let's move to Lauris' keynote presentation. Fingers crossed. Yeah, let's hope. Uh, I sent the PDF of the presentation to Yalmari, so could, okay. I think like we should maybe run it through there. Yeah, let's do so. Okay. Next slide, please. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll talk here a little bit. So, hi everybody, my name is Lauri Lemmenlehti. Um, I'm a landscape architect um, here in here in Helsinki, and um, I uh, I work for a forum Virium Helsinki, uh, which is a uh, innovation company owned by the city of Helsinki, and uh, but I'm actually working inside the city planning department uh, uh, of of the city of Helsinki. And uh, uh, regarding to this augmented urban's project, um, uh, when 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 the project was going on fast, um, I was I was working for a company that uh, was developing these applications uh, for. Uh, for the uh, for the uh, for the project, so uh, now now kind of like the I've I've moved to the to the uh, to the other side of the project as uh, so so I have a few insights that I'd like to share with you about uh, about how does the project making look like from a software develop developer uh, perspective and 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 what could have been the places where we could have done better and 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 where were the problems and 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 how should we go ahead if we want to provide these kind of services in the future 
can I step two slides ahead, please? Uh, so I'm a landscape architect, uh, but I'm specialized in, in uh, digital. Yeah, you can go down to the next slide already. I'm a landscape architect, but I'm specialized into, into digitalization of natural environment and uh, meaning to look at software tools, but also understanding the theory behind like nature and, and really kind of like what does compose nat nature uh, in, in modeling. Uh, here I'm going to kind of like look a little bit to the virtual reality participatory urban planning. Uh, the uh, there before kind of like showed a few images that of what I'm going to show you. Uh, I still wanted to say that it was nice kind of like I've, I've met you like a lot of the people who are on the list I've, I've, I've seen you and we met and we worked together. So it's kind of like really nice to, to, to see all you people here. Uh, then um, I have to say, like when I was working for a company that kind of was developing this software, uh, like these softwares, and we were really, really excited about virtual reality, and and uh, to some level, still I still am, uh, but kind of like uh, after kind of like uh, fighting, kind of like to make a business out of it, and now seeing it from the uh, from the from the client's perspective, also. Uh, there's quite a lot of different hurdles to go go over still uh partly they are uh hardware questions but but big part is is actually developing the softwares and not only the softwares but the joining of the functionalities of these softwares um, can we almari please put the uh, bruno xr video it's a youtube link that i send you on the email um, so this uh, yeah Bruno Granholm XR project Bruno Granholm square this is in the eastern part of of, of uh, Helsinki central and um, what we did here uh, was to develop a uh, game engine. Does anybody see the video moving? I hope so, because I can't. Yes, yes. <laughs> okay, okay. I'll just have to improvise, uh, improvise here and hoping kind of like that I know where I'm going. But basically, this, so this was kind of like developed fully on, on, yeah, on Unity 3D game engine. And the idea was uh, really kind of like to show uh, this dynamic uh, city planning so temporally and climatically uh, uh, climatically uh, dynamic planning so as we know as as most of the participants are in the from the baltics uh, you know like most of the architectural visualizations and and how do we try how we try to visually communicate uh, what are we planning is usually kind of like done in the summer summertime because of course it's visually uh visually interesting and, and and kind of like brings up hope hope to our hearts uh but from from a planning perspective uh i think like the holy grail uh for us as at least as landscape architects is not to make uh plans that work only in the summer but actually make uh these plans that going to work in the mid of november in the evening everything's great in the summer but we actually need to be able to plan uh year around spaces uh and and one of these tools are these virtual reality basically like alternate reality tools so we can show what is existing uh what is planned uh that we can communicate effectively uh the ecosystem services of what nature provides um uh, uh also also kind of like um, what we have to kind of like try to understand even though this XR is very interesting is that there's a huge amount of people who who can't uh, due to due to physical or neurological reasons like I can't ever use these XR devices so one major kind of like part of uh, part of our work is to be able to develop these uh, XR things in a way that they will function also on 2D surfaces. Uh, 
in this Bruno Granholm project, we we went kind of like way over our heads uh, in in developing uh, custom controller systems. Uh, all the all the elements that we uh, uh, built for the for the software would work both on the 2D screen uh, and the uh, uh, and the and the virtual reality experience. A uh, big part of what you're seeing here is uh, is kind of like a virtual camera, so you could actually take snapshots snapshots of the of the of the uh, experience itself in different times of day and sort of like have an Instagram post where you could hashtag your opinion about the plan that was applied and used and it, it worked quite uh, quite nicely. Uh, can we go back to the PDF? Okay, and Bruno XR slide, please. A little bit downwards. There's the video, and a little bit more. Uh, yeah. That was up, 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 up. No, too much. Okay, yeah. So, <clears throat> uh, just for the kind of like complexity, what I what I think kind of like that facilitated to do for us to do something like this. And I think it was kind of like, it was quite demanding, but also from a, uh, I, I have to say that I, I, I think we're not gonna see a lot of this kind of like capable software for a while. And it's not really um, about that kind of like the, the development team would have been like highly technically skilled uh, but more kind of like crazy enough to to tackle these kind of different issues, because uh, it's not just software development. But uh, what we noticed is 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 that there's the sort of like the main thing is the user experience design, and it doesn't kind of like it's not only about the virtual or or mixed reality or augmented uh aug augmented reality design but it's kind of like the user experience of both the virtual use and then also the physical use because when we're talking about the participatory part people usually come uh come to a place and it has to kind of like the whole xr experience exper uh, experience has to slide into into uh, existing norms of how do we participate people into into urban urban planning uh then on top, you have to kind of like if you if you if you uh, give this chance for people to actually use the software that you develop by themselves, the user interface design has to be really good. It's not enough that it's kind of like somebody who really likes these things, but actually we would have to, uh, uh, you know, make them as as simple as possible, so we don't kind of like exclude people who are kind of like low on literacy of 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 it and especially vr as it is so, such a such a new thing uh to create these kind of like um uh, city models that change within the time you kind of like you what we had to do is that there were some benches there were some kind of like street lights that you could that you could use as a, as a planner but when you kind of like start to build this kind of like world that you want to communicate you have to take a lot of different city models some uh older buildings on the site we had to model from scratch uh we we had to model some pylons we had to uh we had to model some lamps and these sort of like auxiliary structures that we have in city space actually make a huge difference if you want to have a sense uh, of, of realism into these experiences. Um, then, then, because uh, this was done in 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 mid 2019, um, basically we had to develop quite a lot of different game engine technologies that didn't exist yet. Uh, already now, like it's been 18 months, things have gone ahead quite a lot. So, so that's uh, that's really good, and. Uh, and from a kind of like architectural or landscape architectural perspective, what's really bad about VR that you can move around is that it will uh, so easily show like what is wrong with the, 
with the plant. So so often often kind of like often uh, in the traditional visualization sense, you have a much more control over these 2D images, and you can kind of like show them from a perf like preferred perspective. Uh, but these are kind of like such a just a just a, such a small part of the whole operation that we did, uh, and and these are huge things. And and not only kind of like that you would find a team that's capable of doing all of these kind of things for a sensible price, uh, the the uh, the person who orders the thing uh, needs to be able also kind of like to write this down and open. Uh, the thing that we did so nicely, uh, and, and what I'm kind of like so so grateful for 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 the Metropolia team and the city of Helsinki, so Päiväntiä, was this kind of like a like a trust uh, for for kind of like uh, for the company that I was working for of 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 kind of like trusting that something nice will come out of this. Without the trust, this would never have had happened. Um, one of the important things, like the the basically the main thing is, if you want to show this kind of like uh, uh, this change of 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 time of the year or time of the day, can I please have the next slide? Is that uh, now that we do city models generally, uh, we tend to think city models buildings as big objects and they're static. And 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 the thing with nature is that it's kind of like changing from second to second, from hour to hour, from day to day, and year to year. So so if you want to model nature, the question is like, what do you model? Uh, and and the answer is basically like that you are modeling a framework of different kind of like natural processes, and you cannot model them statically. You have to model them algorithmically. And and uh, basically, like the tools that we now use, 3D uh, 3D uh, um, modeling software and building information modeling software, basically work outside in this kind of like static uh, static um, static modeling world. And and in in that way, the frame actually uh, limits us quite a lot uh, on on kind of like showing what reality actually is, but. If you if you actually want to do that, the technical solutions to creating that comes out of the game engine, like uh, game engines industry, and uh, just in the kind of like few past years, the development has really been fast, and now there's a new basic basic category of real time renders that are these sort of limited game engines. Uh, that are specialized into into quick visualizations, and then they do low-level simulations like uh, the movement on, of sun and 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 low climatic changes, but on a very visual level. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? Uh, uh, oh, I wonder, did I miss something? Um, yeah. So uh, the can you actually go to the next slide, please, Yalamari? I had made a mistake. And in the in the B Green project that I'm working now at in, in at the city of Helsinki, um, the uh, we've been kind of like uh, looking through the processes that we have in, at the city, and uh, and how do you how would you start implementing these these uh, real-time rendering engines, how would you start putting uh, K-game engines that actually can show these climatical changes, the ecosystem modeling changes, the connections between the different elements of greenery, and uh, uh, and and how do you how do you kind of like raise the level of of, of modeling modeling literacy in general. But basically what we've noticed is is the key aspect is to understand uh, is to understand the the softwares uh, or the usability of the softwares depends on their kind of like capability of of transmitting information within these bigger workflows and and we've recognized that the kind of like the workflow categories basically are that you have data and the model collectors then you have the 3D and BIM they're very useful and uh, usually the city planning departments are working, are implementing this 3D and BIM modeling softwares. And then 
you have real-time rendering, which are basically uh, usable for most uh, planners right now. They're so easily usable. And, and then at the end, like the sort of like the final software solution is, is the game engine that actually can, is built in a way that it can integrate and connect a lot of different data. Um, uh, can we go one step back, Yalmari? Yes. And um, so, so this, um, I think like that the use of these XR solutions, if you want to do this kind of like complex simulate that are kind of like very actually useful, uh, like they're partly dependent on, on, on kind of like on the, on the growth and development of these workflows because they keep the budget of these project, projects uh, down. And as I, as I said before, uh, like we have to still plan them in a way that they work on 2D. Uh, all the holder use, user experience has to build in a way that there's a large part of people uh, in general that cannot ever use these glasses. Um, I think like uh, for, as for hardware, um, Oculus Quest 2, I don't know how many have, have, have of you have used, but this is 350 euros roughly. That starts to be the kind of like price range and uh, we're using them in, in our projects, but that kind of like uh, starts to be working so, re so well already that uh, this seems to be kind of like the first, first like general, general market device um, that we have. Uh, can we step two slides ahead still? That's going to be my last uh, slide. So <clears throat> for this kind of like hardware development, this kind of like there was the CES consumer entertainment. Uh, what is it called? Well, like a mess. What do you call it? Ex exhibition. Exhibition in Las Vegas. Well, sort of Las Vegas virtually, of course. And uh, that's been kind of like traditionally the large, like, uh, that you have a lot of kind of like XR solutions and everything showed it was held actual, the virtual. And I think kind of like the the biggest thing that uh, the that technology that came up now that HTC ca uh, came up, uh, well, they didn't come up with it, but they brought it up first now is this concept of, of all in two. So um, what it basically means is you have your set of uh, head mounted devices uh but instead of kind of like having the controllers your cell phone uh will kind of like give additional computing power uh for the for the glasses that have computing power themselves but then they also functions as the controller with the touch screen and it 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 provides an access point through a fast 5g network into cloud computing and uh um, I think this is kind of like the way it's it's gonna go for the next five. It's gonna start now, and it's gonna start going in, into there. Basically, what it means is that when the standards go ahead in the future, you can use your own cell phone that you know as the controller. Uh, and 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 well, I have to say that uh, when we had our exhibitions about the Brodo Grad Hub, and that was what, 18 months ago, and we were in the public library, for example, and people would come from the street and put kind of like the 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 the, AA, the VR headsets ahead. It kind of like seems completely impossible now and completely impossible that we would have this go around VR devices, even though if we had he had uh, like cleaned them up quite well. I think that's going to be a major issue. So uh, I think like we're going to start seeing that people have to have their own VR devices also to uh, to 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 really use those XR XR. I think I hope it wouldn't be like that. But I I think like people are going to be years scared of of this COVID situation. But this kind of like use your headset, use your own phone, and and use cloud services uh, for kind of like for the software and and for a fast connection and high quality experiences. That's the kind of like the biggest hardware development that's gonna affect the, the next decade. Um, I have a final slide, uh, which is just a thank you. Um, 
please co contact me if you have any questions. Um, Helsinki and Tallinn are working together quite a lot within this uh, green infrastructure and digital tool application in, in both cities. And, and, and uh, we're really, try to, really trying to take a lead role in this uh, green digital development. Thanks. Thank you, Lauri. That was wonderful concluding keynote to this session and also uh, painted future picture or some insights about the future. Uh, time has slightly run out on us, uh, but it's always a challenge when you try to fit three years of project run into few mere hours. Uh, but I think now would be a chance to ask questions uh, or post comments if anyone has. And then, Jalmari, maybe you can put my presentation and uh, uh, let's show again the um, augmented urban's final publication. Uh, is the final public is. So, yeah. so, uh, so the project insights, the policy recommendations, the results have been compiled to augmented urban's final publication, and it's still uh, work on work in progress. Uh, so. There are some things that will be added on still, but you can access it with the password that was shared earlier. And if there are no questions or comments at the moment, we are organizing another session in the afternoon, starting half past one in Finnish time. So half past noon, uh, Swedish time and Yelmari, will share the Zoom link to that if you want to uh, join more interactive discussions there. I'm sorry that we didn't have the time for proper interactive session here. If people are bustling with questions, then we can definitely have some, some discussion now, even though the time is running out. But uh, and yeah. Uh, there is a lot, a lot to be discussed about each of the local accents. They are full worlds on their own, and uh, it's really a broad spectrum of activities that we have under this augmented urban umbrella. So it has been a pleasure to run run this project throughout these years. Yalmari, can you <laughs> change the slides? <laughs> And I, I just want to say thank you for everyone who has been involved, everyone, uh, the speakers today, uh, you for participating. Uh, final, final, final. And um, all of the team members and the developers and everyone. It's, it's quite amazing. The, power of collaboration and the activities that we have achieved together. So thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you for joining us. And uh, please, do we have any questions on chat? No. Then I think we will just conclude this session and welcome you also to join the afternoon. Thank you for participating. Uh, is there questions? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Paivi. Thank you. Thank you, Paivi. Thank you, everybody. You are great. Thank you.